Hello students, welcome back to my channel. In this video, we shall look at short-run macroeconomic equilibrium, also known as determination of equilibrium input and output. This video was requested by one of my student viewer. So I hope you are ready with your pen and paper so that you could make some notes since this topic is a little lengthy and a little more information packed, right? Before wasting any time further, let's quickly take a look at what equilibrium means. So any economy to be in equilibrium will always have this equity in place. It is called AD equal to AS or when aggregate demand for its goods and services would be equal to aggregate supply during a given period of time. So at equilibrium, AD would always be equal to AS. Now, since we are studying two sector model, AD would have only two components, consumption expenditure and investment expenditure. AS, which is necessarily the national income of the economy, comprises of consumption and savings. So if we infuse these two values in this equation, we get something like this, which is AD C plus I equals to AS C plus S. So we strike off the C. The only thing that we are now left with is investments equals to savings. That means under the Keynesian theory, macroeconomic equilibrium in the short run could be attained through two approaches. First approach is ADAS approach, which is aggregate demand, aggregate supply approach and savings investment approach. So assumptions are we are assuming the investment to be autonomous or independent of the level of national income. So it, it will remain constant. We are studying it under the two sector model. So the two sectors that we have are households and firms. Price level is assumed to remain constant and we are studying it from the short run point of view. Let's take a look at aggregate demand, aggregate supply approach first. When we take a look at this equilibrium schedule, we have many columns listed here, namely employment, income, consumption, savings, investment, aggregate demand, which is a total of C plus I and aggregate supply, which is a total of C plus S and remarks. We'll take a look about it later. So when we take a look at employment, it is increasing onwards from zero to 50 and these figures are in millions. Um, income again goes up from 0 to 500. Consumption also shows an upward trend from 20 to 420. Savings begins with negative, becomes 0 and then goes up. Investment is constant at 40. Aggregate demand is a combination or as we say aggregate demand is an addition of C plus I. So 20 plus 40 gives me 60 and that's how I've derived the entire figures here. Aggregate supply is a addition of consumption plus savings. So plus 20 minus 20 gives you zero. And likewise, I've derived the entire figures under aggregate supply. Now, if we compare the figures here and here, they are the same. Hence, we say that aggregate supply is also the national income of the country. When we take a look at the remarks segment, the first three cases seem to have the same scenario where aggregate demand is greater than aggregate supply. What this means is something we'll take a look at later. The fourth scenario indicates aggregate demand equaling aggregate supply and thereafter aggregate demand tends to fall short of aggregate supply. Now this is how we represent the aggregate demand aggregate supply approach graphically. So this is the aggregate supply curve, which is a 45 degree line. And this is the alternate names that we could use. This is the aggregate demand curve. And this is the alternate name for it. We see that aggregate demand begins from a point above the origin, indicating autonomous consumption. And because of which we see that the savings is a negative amount because people would be falling back on their investments or savings or maybe borrowings to take care of that expenditure all right now this is the point e where there is equilibrium attained under the adas approach and this is the level of income output and employment in this particular economy to the left of point e we clearly see that ad is greater than as 
So when there is more of aggregate demand compared to aggregate supply, it indicates that there is an inflationary gap in the economy. So it simply would mean that people are willing to buy more than what is available in the economy, leading to shortages in the markets. Now, this shortages could lead to scarcity and may lead to emergence of black markets or gray markets in the economy. So technically to overcome this situation, the government may have to implement contractionary fiscal policies, the central bank may have to implement monetary policies. The major aim would be to bring down the demand so as to it could be equated with aggregate supply again and the equilibrium in the economy could be restored. To the right of this point, we see that aggregate supply is greater than aggregate demand. It simply indicates that people are not buying enough that is available in the economy. The demand is falling short of aggregate supply, indicating a recessionary gap. All right. Now, this would mean that there is excess inventory in the economy because businesses face piled up inventories of goods and services. This would force them to cut down on their production, further leading to uh, unemployments and layoffs, reduced work hours, so on and so forth. So to cater to this situation, the government may have to implement expansionary fiscal policies and the central banks may have to implement expansionary monetary policies so as to expand the aggregate demand and bring it more closer to aggregate supply so that the economic recovery could be promoted. All right. Let's take a look at how the equilibrium would be depicted under the savings investment approach. So we've already seen that this is the point of equilibrium here in aggregate demand and aggregate supply approach. And this is the same point where you would see equilibrium under the savings and investment approach. And this is what I've written here. So now in this graph, the first half of the graph or the first panel is what we've just seen in the previous slide. It is the second panel that we are supposed to focus on. So this is the point of equilibrium and aligned to this, we have a point of equilibrium under the savings and investment approach. Now, when we see here, which is to the left of this point, we see that investment is greater than savings, clearly indicating that people are consuming more than what they are investing and to depict that we see that the savings curve moves upwards from the negative quadrant becomes zero and then it tends to become positive until it becomes equal with the investment at the point of equilibrium now whenever investments are um, greater than savings it would simply mean that people are consuming more and in that case the planned inventory would fall below the desired level and it would become necessary for the businesses to increase their productivity so as to increase income output and employment. To the right of point E, savings is greater than investment indicating that consumers are not consuming as much and they are saving more. Now this is something which would lead to recessionary gap in the economy and again it will become necessary for the government to uh, deploy all its uh, expansionary fiscal policies and central banks would deploy monetary policies to increase the purchasing power so that consumption could increase and savings would again become equal to investments. So this is how this entire uh, equilibrium under savings and investment approach is studied. Students, I hope you found this video useful. I hope you did make your notes so that you are able to understand what exactly is what and what is meant by a recessionary gap and what is meant by an inflationary gap, okay? Also, if you do find my videos useful, do like and subscribe to my channel and do not hesitate to share my videos with your friends. I'll meet you with another topic in another video. Bye now. Take care.